another minute or so. Again, if you are just joining us, please do introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're joining from, perhaps your organization and what your interest is in ROAR. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll get started in I think uh, um, just a moment. Um, as you all probably know, the call is being recording, recorded and the recording and slides will be shared uh, after the meeting. Um, so um, please be aware of that. Um, if you would like, uh, you can turn on captions in other languages. Um, and we'd be happy for you to participate that way. Oops. Gosh, dang it. Sorry, I think I'm accidentally advancing the slides. <laughs> Here we are. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as I said, let us know uh, who you are and where you're joining from. Uh, let us know what your interest is in ROAR, uh, if you haven't already done so. This is our agenda for the day. Um, we're going to go over just some uh, general updates. Uh, we'll have some technical updates from our technical lead, Liz Krasnarich. We'll have curation updates from Adam Buttrick. Um, I will tell you a little bit about ROAR adoption uh, in systems that we, that we know about. And then we're going to have uh, one uh, special guest speaker, uh, Kelly Stathis from Datasite, who's going to talk to us about publisher identifiers in Datasite metadata. And then we should have at least 10 minutes at the end of the call um, for questions and answers. Just a general intro to these community calls. If you haven't previously attended one, um, they're held every other month. They're open to anyone. Um, we do focus on updating you on what's new with ROAR, uh, new technical developments, new uh, policy developments. Um, we typically, uh, periodically, we have specific topics or specific proposals for community feedback, and we'll share those at these calls as well as in other channels. And then very often we have at least one and, and more often two uh, demonstrations or uh, presentations from ROAR integrators where they show what they've done with ROAR and uh, solicit feedback on that and tell people how they've done it. We announce these calls on the uh, quite new ROAR community forum and on our events webpage, and of course on our, our social media. We uh, strongly encourage you to uh, participate. Uh, you can post any questions in the chat that you like. Um, and of course, we do try to leave time for Q&A at the end. Uh, we do record these calls and we'll send the slides and recordings to everyone who registered, as well as posting them publicly on our events page and the Roar YouTube channel. Um, we do ask everyone to abide by our code of contact, conduct. Um, we've got the link uh, in the slides here, but you can also go to our website uh, to the community page and scroll down to see and read our code of conduct. And then if you like, uh, do feel free to click show captions in Zoom to show captions in your language. Beyond these calls, uh, we also encourage your participation. We have a roadmap where we're happy to take uh, schema change requests, um, feature requests, all kinds of things, uh, bug reports. Uh, so feel free to contribute to that. That's on GitHub. Uh, we have discussion forums. We have one for sort of general ROAR topics, and then we have one that's more uh, for technical topics, and as well as release announcements uh, whenever the registry is updated. And uh, we encourage everyone uh, to submit curation requests for changes to and additions to the registry. And then if you are using ROAR, um, there's a link to the form here. Uh, we can put that perhaps in the chat um, telling us about uh, how you use ROAR or even are planning to use ROAR. You don't have to have an active ROAR integration at the moment to tell us about your plans to use ROAR. Uh, so now I'm going to turn this over to uh, ROAR Director Maria Gould, who is going to give us some general updates. Maria? Hello, everyone. Good to see all of you here today. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm just going to run through a few quick announcements about some things that have been going on at ROAR and are coming up with ROAR in the last couple months and months ahead. 
So first quick announcement for everyone is that we are in the process of transitioning and consolidating some of the communication channels that we use to share updates about things that we're doing at ROAR and also to invite community discussion and feedback. So one immediate change that is in process right now is that we are transitioning the ROAR Slack to a community forum hosted on Google Groups. So we've announced this in the previous call, I believe, and also made some announcements in the ROAR Slack. We previously had an open Slack workspace for community discussion, but we also had separate community mailing lists and other kinds of channels. And so we're trying to consolidate those a little bit so that we have the conversations happening in one place and it's easier to keep track of the different news and updates and conversations that are being circulated. So the immediate thing to know is that if you are in the Roar Slack right now, that is going to be shut down on June 5th. And we are going to be reserving some aspects of that Slack for internal communication among the team. The other important thing to know is that we want you to join the ROAR community forum, which will be the new discussion space and communication channel about all things ROAR. So if you have not already signed up to join, please do so. It is a Google group. You don't need a Google account to be part of it. And if you have any issues joining, or if you want us to add you manually, you can send us an email and we'll get you set up. So that is announcement number one, and we look forward to seeing you in the new forum. It will be a place for us to share updates about things that we want everyone to know about ROAR, but also a place for all of you to ask questions and share information as well. So the next thing I wanted to mention, okay. The next thing I wanted to mention is that we are in the um, in a full events season right now. There's lots of events underway happening around the world and we would love to see you at some of those events if you will be there too. So we have all of this listed on the events page of the ROAR website but just a quick summary of some of the places where you might find one or more members of the ROAR team are listed here. That's the SSP meeting, Society for Scholarly Publishing meeting in Boston next week, where you can spend some time with Amanda. Uh, Adam and I will be at PIDFest in Prague. So please let us know if you will be there too. We would love to hang out with you there. And also in Prague, co-located with PIDFest, we will be participating in an ICSTI workshop uh, about persistent identifiers. And Amanda will be teaching along with Kelly, I believe, and some other other close collaborators in the PID community, uh, a course on uh, querying APIs and open metadata services as part of the Force 11 Scholarly Communications Institute in July. So please get in touch if you would like to meet up at any of these events. So my last announcement also has to do with uh, the faces of the ROAR team. I know that there are some new faces here on the call today, as well as some familiar ones. And so I thought it would be an opportune moment uh, to uh, remind everybody about some of the faces behind the names on the ROAR team. And also for those of you who are already familiar with, uh, with the ROAR team, we've undergone some slight transitions uh, over the past couple of months in terms of our home bases. So I thought I would update everybody on that as well. So we have a small ROAR team. And as a reminder to everybody, we operate ROAR as a collaborative initiative across three organizations, California Digital Library, Crossref, and Datacite. As part of that operating model, we have a shared staffing and resourcing model where uh, members of the ROAR team are based at uh, one of those organizations. So uh, 
the team right now has has not changed in terms of the the actual people and faces that that many of you have known over the years. Uh, I am serving in my capacity as Roar Director. We have Amanda as Technical Community Manager, Adam as our uh, curation lead, and uh, Liz as our technical lead. But some slight updates to that configuration that are worth letting everybody know about. I was previously based in my role at California Digital Library and then earlier this year took on a new role at Datasite, leading our product department at Datasite. So I'm continuing to support Roar in my capacity as product director at Datasite. Another change that has just happened is that uh, Adam has assumed a new position at California Digital Library, where he will be supporting product management activities around persistent identifiers, including Roar. So the scope of his role is slightly changing as a result of that, but he will still be supporting many of our curation activities in his new, in the capacity of his new role, given that the Roar registry data and our curation process is a key part of our product offering. So congratulations to Adam on taking on this new role. And rest assured everyone that the, the busy and fantastic activities of the curation process are still ongoing. And that leads me to the final update of who's who on the Roar team, which is that we are hiring uh, a replacement for the position that Adam held at Crossref, and that has just been posted as of yesterday. So this will be a role as metadata manager to uh, support and work with Adam on ongoing curation activities to uh, also work with the Crossref team on supporting metadata activities at Crossref more generally. So very exciting position for anyone interested in metadata and metadata curation and all things persistent identifiers. So we will put the link in the chat and we hope that you can circulate it to your network so that we can find the, the right face to fill out this picture on the slide here. So I think that concludes my round of announcements about some new developments on the Roar team and Roar activities. And I will hand it back to Amanda. Thank you, Maria. Um, uh, next, we have uh, some technical updates from our intrepid technical lead, Liz Kurznarich, who is going to tell you uh, mostly about the very exciting launch of Roar V2 back in April. Liz? Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, so those who have joined this meeting in the past might know that we have been working on an updated schema, data model, and um, API changes for a long time. Uh, we started in fall of 2022. So it's been almost two years that we have been working on various uh, parts of this. Um, I won't take too much time to, to explain all of the details because we have talked about it before in this meeting, but we have lots of documentation if you'd like to see the complete background. But we had many months of community input, uh, multiple rounds to get to the point of making um, our first major schema and API uh, version update, which is a quite significant um, set of changes because uh, we started with the schema we inherited from Grid over the years that Roar has been curating independently from Grid. Um, we began to notice quite a few things that, um, that both internally we'd like to change and that externally we were receiving requests for changes to, and we wanted to start out by making one big set of changes that we hopefully won't have to make major modifications to for a good long time. We'll be looking at mostly making um, more minor updates. So I'm just gonna hit the high points in, in this overview and you can look through the documentation yourself. So the big announcement is that we did finally launch version two um, in both our API and our data dumps. And most importantly, we started curating new 
uh, requests for record updates and new records uh, beginning on April 11th um, of 2024. So the first version that was curated in version two is uh, data release 1.45. Um, so we're still for the moment continuing on with the same data release versions um, because the default version in the API is actually still one. Um, but from data release 1.45, you will see um, two sets of data dump files, both in version one and version two. So there are four files total, two JSON files, two CSV files in the zip archive. Um, we now have two versions of the API available. The version you can specify in the path portion of the request. Currently, uh, if you don't specify a path portion in your API request, um, the default version is still version one. Obviously, we don't want to break people's integrations immediately. So that default is going to remain at version one for um, for the at least the next year. And then we'll look at switching the default. And after that, um, we will eventually sunset version one. But we're going to give people plenty of time um, to make changes to their integrations uh, before we do that. So lots more announcements um, coming about those changes. So some key changes, there are changes to almost every part of the, the record in V2. It's actually a bit shorter, more compact. Um, and again, you'll see four files instead of two in the, uh, in the data dump. Um, if we look a little bit closer, go back one bit, a big, uh, a big change that we were really looking forward to making is adding um, some administrative metadata created and last modified dates, as well as the schema version that the record was created and last modified. Um, simple change, but something that was really needed and not included in the grid metadata. What that means is that it's now possible to search for records created or modified um, between specific dates. So for example, we can take a look at the records that were modified since the V2 uh, release and today. So this is an example of that query. And what we would see is that there are um, about 78,000 records that were modified uh, between that point, which is a lot because we did go back and backfill some um, some V2 fields that didn't exist in V1 after we did the initial release. Adam's going to tell you a lot more uh, about that, but there have been quite a few records uh, touched since we made that initial release. Um, a part of the record that has been changed that will affect almost everyone who uses the Roar API is the structure of the names fields. We previously had four different fields that contained uh, different types of names. Those have all been combined into one, um, and the names now have a type. Uh, the types are label, acronyms, uh, label, acronym, alias, and Roar display. Um, the label, acronym, alias is derived from those four separate fields that we had previously. So the type in, is an indication of where the, um, what field that name value resided in previously. Um, good news is all names now support language codes. So it is, uh, is now much easier to figure out what language a particular name value is in. Um, location information has been simplified and combined all into into one field. There was a lot of um, superfluous geonames data in the record previously. We've condensed that into the fields that are um, most used by the most people. Um, one big change that should be helpful for folks who are eventually um, converting over from Crossref Funder Registry to Roar is that we've added Funder as an organization type. Uh, so we have a list of allowed uh, types, each record has at least one type assigned to it in the types field, but they can have multiple types. Um, and we have gone in and backfilled uh, types with funder for those organizations that have a currently have a Crossref funder ID in 
their ROAR record. So when you filter a request by funder, you are getting things that exist in the Crossref funder registry, and you can filter any, um, in the API, you can filter any type of query um, or request except for affiliation um, string matching uh, by the organization type. And then of course, in the data dump, you can do what you like with the types, but the types have been updated. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, I'm happy to take your questions in the chat, but we do have a huge amount of documentation that um, both Amanda and others have worked very hard on. Um, there's a, a quick summary of all the technical changes that is in our change log on our documentation site. So for technical folks, if you just want to look at all the um, all the changes, it's there. A more human readable version of that is in a blog post. And um, most importantly, our uh, documentation is now completely versioned. So there's a little dropdown you can uh, click to switch between v1 and v2. So the full documentation exists in both v1 and v2. A lot of it is actually the same. The requests are are the same just with the different um, the different path portion and nothing really functionally has changed about the API. It's the the record format that is returned and also because the record, Content is slightly different in V2. The results returned from it, from particular search queries uh, are necessarily different because they've got different content in the uh, in the records that are being returned. Although the quick search of names works exactly the same way, those results should be um, should be the same. And uh, that is. It. Happy to answer your questions in the chat. And Adam's going to tell you more about uh, some curation updates that we made following V2. But before that, uh, we actually have a really brief poll that is about version two. I'm going to launch that right now. These are the two questions um, just about your plans to use V2 and any other questions or concerns you have about it. Can everyone see the poll? So um, we've got some answers coming in. Um, so far, we've got um, about half of you answering. Uh, about 20% say you're already using V2. I think these share the answers as soon as I end the poll. Um, about 14% of you are planning to switch this year. Um, only a few of you are planning to switch net next year. And quite a few of you are planning to begin using Roar V2 this year. Um, and then some of you are just not quite sure of your plans. Um, so yeah, that's been one minute. Let's end it. And these are the results. Can you access the results? Okay, great. Terrific information. Okay, so um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Adam, who is going to tell you about some of these uh, curation um, activities that we have going on. Adam? Yeah, thanks, Amanda. So uh, for Q2, our curation work has been focused on making improvements to our data to support all those new uh, wonderful elements that we added with version two of our schema, which includes improving our whole curation pipeline, actually, to support them as part of request processing. So those things like language tagging are happening, happening automatically. Um, leveraging some great new bulk uh, update functionality that Liz built out. We first, as she mentioned, completed work on adding the funder type to all records with funder IDs in Roar, which allows for a more scoped and filterable view of these records. Um, from there, we moved on to language tagging for name metadata, which I'll describe in a bit more detail with the next slide. So it's kind of a really complex problem. <laughs> you know, we have all of these names. Many of them don't have languages. Some do that we inherited from grid. Um, so what we did to tag languages for name metadata was to first extract from Roar the set of labels and their corresponding language tagging. 
Um, this comprised about 30,000 name values with tagged languages. We use this data set then to evaluate the performance of various language detection libraries, essentially saying how well can you know, this library predict the existing language assignments. Um, after isolating those that perform best against that label data, uh, data set, uh, specifically uh, the FastX library and a library called Lingua, we combine these two into a, a consensus language detection strategy. Um, so how this works is we prioritize the agreement between the two detection methods, considering the combined confidence score, as well as the most common languages for a given country um, as identified in the existing language tagging in ROAR. So, you know, we have all of these records from all over the world. They have labels with language assignment. We use that as a data point to kind of uh, inform the prediction. So on this test data set, this performed at about 96.5% uh, precision and 99% recall um, against all those labels. So we then use this method to detect languages for all labels and alias values in ROAR, excluding those in company records um, for reasons that would probably require um, a lecture on like the philosophy of language about like what is a proper noun company name, like what is the correct language for it, who can say. Um, but since our testing against this label data set showed an error rate in around the 3.5% error range, what we then did um, is take those language uh, tagging results and not just immediately ingest them, but run them through an additional layer of outlier detection and then did manual correction, review and correction relative to the results. So here we revised about 4,000 language assignments, meaning I went through, I looked at them all and made manual corrections, which corresponds to the expected error rate relative to the total number of predictions, which is about 100,000. So remember, we had about 96.5% pre um, precision in our test data set. So we predict 100,000. We see about 4,000 that appear to be outliers. We go in and correct them, um, which brings us to the current results of uh, the language tagging in ROAR. So as you can see here, the percentage of aliases with language tags increased from 1.5% to 91.5%. And the percentage of labels with language tags increased from 26 to 98%. In terms of a total uh, increase in kind of tagged values, uh, we went to from 29,000 to 130,000 tagged values. So that's a pretty good improvement overall. Um, as we move ahead, we'll be looking at some additional improvements relative to the V2 schema. Um, these include adding domain values. We've done some initial reconciliation against edge gain data that we'll look at incorporating as well as assessing what can be derived from link metadata in ROAR as I believe ORCID is already using um, for to inform some of their new functionality for predicting affiliations on the basis of email domains. Um, we'll then be doing some bulk reconciliation of Wikidata IDs, pulling in all IDs that have been associated or created for our records. Okay, um, that's all from me. I'll turn things over to Amanda for adoption updates. Happy to answer any questions in the chat. Yes, and I think we do have actually quite a few questions in the chat, um, uh, many about Latin character sets and raw display names. So uh, yeah, I'd appreciate Liz and Adam and perhaps Maria um, answering those questions. Uh, some of them I'm not quite sure okay. the answers to myself. <laughs> uh, so yes, um, uh, while that's going on, I am also going to tell you a little bit about um, uh, news, adoption news, who's using ROAR. I, as, I, as I mentioned, I think earlier, I'm excited to hear that the UNC repository is planning to integrate ROAR. Um, so I would have put that on the slide had I known that before the call. Um, so to my mind, one of the most exciting um, pieces of news about ROAR adoption is that the very widely used manuscript tracking system editorial manager has authorized me to say that adding ROAR IDs to their XML metadata exports is on their roadmap for 2024. They're not officially listed as a ROAR integrator and um, because, you know, I think their plans are a bit up in the air. They, they are committed to doing it, but the how and the when is still a little bit, a little bit iffy. Um, but I think that's great news because they're one of two uh, major, major service providers in terms of sort of manuscript systems um, that is going to really ensure that raw IDs get specifically into DOI metadata. I think this is the way a lot of publishers do it. They export the XML from, from this system and uh, send it on to Crossref. So very excited about that. Um, and as you know, I mean, sometimes things slip from roadmaps um, from year to year. So it could be 2025, but they have absolutely committed to doing it. Um, uh, and I'm very pleased to have heard that. Um, it is also the case, I had a, a very nice meeting with um, a somewhat less uh, less widely used, but still um, 
terrific manuscript tracking system called Manuscript Manager, um, which as is often the case for these things, has actually been using Roar IDs for a while, uh, which we didn't know. Um, but uh, they're specifically using it in their peer review um, workflow. Um, so that's great to know. The Helmholtz Association of German Research Centers is, as you can tell, sort of an association, um, rather it's not really a system, it's not even really, um, you know, a particular, um, you know, an organization with one system, but they are recommending ROAR as their main point of truth to all of its many data providers, which is fantastic. Um, and then finally, uh, there's a platform called Molgenis, which is uh, based in Germany, uh, which is planning a feature for mapping organizations to ROAR which is great. Um, and by the way, if you are planning to use Roar, um, please let us know. Um, we do have an integration form. You can also just email me at amanda at or community at roar.org and we'd love to list you publicly. So I typically share some graphs uh, about Roar adoption. Um, here is uh, Roar IDs and Crossref affiliations. We've been tracking this since early 2022 when Crossref first began supporting Roar. Um, so we've passed the 120,000 mark, which is not so bad. Uh, and I always like to break this down by type. Um, for the longest time, um, uh, Michael Parkin's group, uh, Emble, was uh, registering grants with Roar IDs on behalf of Welcome, and those were by far the uh, sort of largest item types and items with Roar IDs. And I'm, uh, you know, no shade to Michael, but I am always glad to see that journal articles have outstripped uh, grants in terms of uh, the number of the, the types of items that have Roar IDs, because that probably is the way it should be. That's certainly Crossroads' major. Um, item type, although they are also registering DOIs for grants, which is a good thing and should be more widely adopted. Um, we have um, one massive user of Roar IDs, uh, sending them in DOIs to Crossref, uh, made a big jump earlier this year. IADB, they're um, a library for a, a kind of a policy think tank uh, library in DC. Um, so that's great. Lots of reports in Crossref with Roar IDs, dissertations, and peer reviews, also quite uh, quite commonly used item types. In Datasight, Datasight had adopted Roar quite a bit earlier, um, always um, kind of a, a, an impressive number of Roar IDs in Datasight, specifically for uh, creator and contributor affiliations. Um, we're nearing the 2 million mark. Uh, perhaps when we reach that milestone, we can have a bit of a celebration. Uh, 1.79 is the, the most recent number. And then um, because Datasite does accept uh, multiple types of IDs, I've been uh, really interested in tracking this. Um, Roar IDs for affiliations is, you know, by far the, the most used identifier in Datasite. Uh, most of the remaining grid usages are from Figshare installations, and I think they will convert eventually. And then also uh, Datasite um, increasingly has a quite a large proportion of Roar IDs used for as funding identifiers, although again they are one one adopter of Roar IDs for for funders um, accounts for can account for quite a bit of that. Um, so that's always good to see. I've recently begun tracking Roar in ORCID records. And uh, so th these are very recent. You can see this is just since the beginning of April. Um, and this, as you can see, is only increasing. Um, so just over time, um, added nearly 40,000 um, Roar IDs to ORCID records just in the last less than two months. Um, always very impressive just in terms of scale. Um, but in this little table on the right, um, again, the ORCID API, like the Datasite API, allows me to query it based on uh, what kinds of identifiers people are using. Um, and so it occurred to me belatedly only a, a, a couple of weeks ago to begin tracking that in ORCID. So I've just started collecting this data. Uh, but so one of the things you can see is that while the majority of IDs in ORCID records, organizational identifiers are Ringgold identifiers, if you do a little bit of the math there, um, Roar IDs are certainly increasing more than either the use of funder IDs or Ringgold IDs. Um, so we've added, you know, roughly 6,000 Roar IDs just in the last couple of weeks um, to organizations in various places in somebody's ORCID record. Um, and the way ORCID does it is they allow any of these IDs to be used for 
um, essentially any organization. So even if you're employed by an organization, you could use a funder ID to identify that and so on. So I think that's quite interesting. And as we collect more data, it'll be interesting to see those numbers change. Um, so that's really about all for me about uh, ROAR adoption news and statistics. And I'd now like to turn it over to Kelly Stathis from Datasite, who's going to talk to us about publisher identifiers in Datasite metadata. Kelly? Great, thanks so much, Amanda. Um, yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Kelly Stathis. I'm Datasite's technical community manager. Um, and I'm here today to share a bit about our latest update to the Datasite metadata schema. Um, the most recent version was released back in January, version 4.5. Um, and one of the changes in that was to add the capability to include identifiers for publishers. Let's see if the slide control works here. Beautiful. All right, so publisher has always been one of the six mandatory properties in the data site metadata schema. Um, and in this version 4.5, we've added some attributes to this publisher property to support identifiers. So there's a publisher identifier attribute for the identifier itself. There's publisher identifier scheme for the, the source of the identifier. So for example, Aurora. And scheme URI, which is the URI where the identifier scheme is located. So that would be something like Aurora.org. And this is not the only place in data site where these links or connections can be created to related PIDs. And so there's various other places where works, people, and organizations can be connected to each other. Um, through the schema, we can say things like a data set is cited by a paper with a DOI, data set is created by a researcher with an ORCID ID. You can say that researcher is affiliated with an organization with a ROAR ID. Um, that was one of the charts that Amanda was just showing the, the rate of adoption for that. We can also say that a data set or another resource type is just a data set in the example, but all the resource types that are supported by a data site schema. Um, we can say that that resource is funded by an organization and that can be with the ROAR ID or across our funder ID. Um, and as we've seen, there's quite a bit of usage of cross our funder registry there, but also increasingly usage of ROAR in that field. And so this change extends this chart to now also add the connections to publishers, um, where you can say that a research output or a resource is published by an organization. And I've put an asterisk on that for organization because I think the question of what is a publisher is kind of an irrelevant one here. And so when we were looking at adding this to the schema, um, we were thinking, okay, so for publishers that are research organizations, it makes sense to recommend using a ROAR ID. Um, but not every publisher that we're seeing in the, the free text values for publishers is a research organization that would be in scope for ROAR. Um, Oops, sorry, I just lost my windows here. Here we go. Um, so some of them might be the name of a repository, which is hosted by an organization, but the repository isn't itself an organization. Um, we also see things like um, a university library, where that's a department within the university as an organization. So these would not themselves have ROAR IDs. And so we followed the model that we had done for affiliation identifiers and a couple other places in the schema where we have it open-ended. So you can provide any type of identifier for publisher identifier, and then you indicate which type you're using with the publisher identifier scheme attribute. Um, so there you can say it's ROAR ID, um, if you use a read three data ID for if you want to use a repository identifier, or various other types. We've listed some examples in the schema documentation, but this is um, open to um, the metadata provider to select and to provide whatever identifier they, they choose. And so with this, um, I want to show kind of how the structure has changed in um, our API and our JSON structure to support this. And so originally this was just a, a string value for publisher. Um, and with this change, we needed to change the structure to support not only the string value for the name, but also the identifier, the scheme, scheme URI. Um, and also we've have the, the language in here too that was, I think, already supported in our XML structure, but not in JSON. And now we have this object, we can add that and expose that in the API as well. And this was um, done, so if you're, if you're retrieving metadata with the REST API, um, to avoid having a breaking change here, we added a new flag to this to 
um, select what, what metadata you're receiving. And so you have this publisher equals true parameter, and that indicates that you would like to be shown the new publisher structure. And this is similar to how we did this with the affiliation changes back in schema 4.3. Um, eventually, when we are able to version our API, we would have these be in the, the new version of the API. But for now, we're working with a single version where we want to make sure that users are getting consistent structures. We don't break existing integrations. And so you have to opt in to receiving this revised structure with this attribute, uh, with this parameter, rather. And so in this example, um, we're showing getting DOIs with publisher identifiers. Um, with a specific publisher identifier. And so here, publisher equals true is saying, show me the new JSON structure. And then that query where you're looking for that specific raw ID is saying, um, filter this down to DOIs with this specific publisher identifier. And I just want to note that these operate independently. So publisher true is not saying, get me DOIs only with publisher identifiers. It's saying, show me this structure. And then you're using the query here to filter this down and restrict which DOIs you're retrieving. So that's the change for the REST API. Um, we've also made some changes in data site commons when you're looking at finding works that are connected to organizations. And so if you're searching for an organization in commons, you're getting organizations with raw IDs and you're getting works that are related to um, the organization on that organization page. And so we've retrieved works that are um, where the creator is affiliated with the organization, where that organization is itself the creator or contributor, um, works funded by the organization, and now also works published by that organization when that's indicated via the publisher identifier. So you may see um, in new, new works showing up in this as organizations, as repositories start to add publisher identifiers um, and raw IDs into this field. So looking at adoption here, I just updated these numbers yesterday. So we've seen since January, um, 428 repositories have included at least one publisher identifier. Um, we've got around 3,000 repositories in data sites. So it's actually pretty good um, in that short time. Um, and that is for just over 14,000 DOIs that have a publisher identifier. Um, and looking at these, I thought it was interesting. We're seeing the vast majority of these are using raw IDs. Um, there are a handful where they've provided a RE3 data ID, and then a few where they didn't indicate the publisher identifier scheme value. And I would need to look, dig into those to see what, what value is actually there. It might be a raw ID that isn't, isn't labeled. It might be something else. Um, and within this adoption so far, we have a few, the, the top three users here are the ones that have registered over 1,000 DOIs with the publisher identifier, and that's the Columbia University data platform. The University of Delaware and the UKRI, um, UK Research and Innovations Environmental Data Service. Um, and so I should have included this. There's actually quite a, a long tail of adoption here. I think part of this is because we added into our web interface Fabrica where you can manually register um, individual DOIs. So there's a lookup there for publisher where as you're typing a pu publisher name, it suggests options. And when you select one of those, it provides the raw ID for you. So we're seeing that our users that are manually registering smaller numbers of individual DOIs with that web interface, um, taking advantage of that suggestion functionality, which is similar to what we have for affiliation. Oh, I did include, no, sorry, this is, um okay, yeah, this is the, the top few users, but if I had included the next piece here, there's a big bar that is the everyone else in this. Um, and this also shows you um, with each of these, which varieties, it's kind of hard to see in the diagram, but basically for most of them, it's a single variety in that publisher identifier because they're indicating themselves as the institution, as the publisher. Um, but then there's a couple where you see a, a little bit more colorful bar where there's a variety of publisher values and, and raw identifiers coming from that repository. So that was interesting to see these, these patterns so far with these early adopters. I think, yeah, I think that's all I had. So I'm happy to take any questions on this. Um, and we've also got documentation on our support site on how to get started adding these if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, that was fascinating. Um, I have a really specific question. I saw Fondren, Fondren Library in your uh, previous slide. Feel like I should remember what is that Rice University? I can't remember. I don't know if you remember. 
I would have to no check that. Out. Yes, sorry. I don't know either. Yeah, I can let you know after. Okay. I can give you more detail I, on these. I recognize yeah. that library name and I cannot remember where it is. I, my guess is Rice, but that, yeah, great. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so now uh, we do have 14 minutes left on the call. Uh, we have had quite an active chat, uh, but we'd be happy to, to take any questions. Um, I think um, one question that, um, oh good, look, I did get the Fondren library <laughs> correct. I have a friend who works there. Um, uh, one question that I had um, for Kelly, I, I think I thought your adoption um, usage statistics were quite interesting and perhaps you've already answered this a bit, but uh, what some of the use cases for uh, publisher identifiers in the data, data site metadata schema might be. Um, you did mention many of these are identifying themselves as publishers, uh, but I am curious about why this was an important thing to include in the metadata schema and what uses you think it will, will have. Yeah, for sure. I think like this case of finding everything associated with an organization is a big one. So we're already doing that um, with the you know, affiliation associations, funding, creation, and publisher is another clear place where we're saying, okay, you're referring to an organization here, but there's no PID um, capability available until right. this version. Um, I'm definitely interested to see how folks might be starting to query with this. I mean, it's always tricky kind of early days because this adoption is you know, such a small percentage of DOIs overall. So if you were really looking for everything from a given organization, you probably would also want to do some name searching um, or looking at the, the repository, the, the client name in our, in our API's terminology. But that's similar to situations like with affiliation where to get a really comprehensive look, you're having to also look at name values as our users are still gradually adopting identifiers in, in the schema and the metadata they provide. Do you think that, um, I have not thought this through, but do you think, uh, one issue that comes up quite a bit is uh, matching data sets to journal articles. Do you think that having persistent identifiers in that publisher field will help with that problem? That's an interesting question. Like if it's if you're thinking it's like the same publisher between the data set well, and the journal article? This or... is what I've just realized is that mostly not always when the journal article and the data set, one reason why it's hard to link them sometimes is because they're not, they don't have the same publisher. Right. So no, right. It won't help. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And that's, um, I would say that the main way to support that is related identifiers and right. citations, right. Depending on which, which direction. So in data site metadata, you can add a related identifier saying this data set is, cited by this article and then in the cross ref metadata you could also say this there's a citation of this data set so making sure that gets in there yeah got it yeah i'll also just add that use of persistent identifiers when there's a known policy at an organization about data publishing that says you're supposed to be publishing here um when they're identified persistently it's very easy to narrow down the set of data that is that so if there appear to be things missing um that can be a flag to kind of match better um those data sets and research outputs. So there's always essentially an advantage to having the persistent identifier, whether it be, you know, finding things that um, are there and associated with it or finding there things that should be there and aren't associated with it. Um, I see uh, Sasha Schwartzman, Schwartzman has published, uh, has, has put a question in the chat. Um, I'll read it out loud. Why is it that some funders in the funder registry were uh, that are associated with the EU are associated with individual countries in the EU in the RAW registry? What's the authority for associating a particular organization with a particular country or the entire EU? Adam, I think you may be the best. Yeah, so position. I really can't speak to how anything was populated in the funder registry because their curation practices are entirely opaque. Um, and so I don't know the derivation uh, of their assignments. G generally, um, for all records in ROAR, um, our locations are at a more granular level based on the organization's self-assertion. So, you know, for example, many EU organizations are based in Brussels, um, and that's what they assert in their contact information, their address. So that's the location that we would use in the corresponding ROAR record. It might be that they have kind of an EU-wide function, um, but when we're talking about the location of the organization, we're really referring 
referring to the organization's self-description. So um, that would be the kind of general answer to that question. And you know what, what that reminds me of um, is that last year at Open Repositories, which was in South Africa, um, we did hear from quite a few um, South African organizations, African organizations, that they would appreciate um, a kind of a geographic grouping um, function in ROAR. Open Alex actually does this. So in Africa, of course, um, they want to be able to track often, many people want to be able to track things not only by country, but essentially by continent. We would like to know, track things by um, whether they're in Africa or not. Um, and I, I can imagine that that would be exactly the same for EU. So we actually have an outstanding issue on our roadmap, which is kind of on our, you know, this might be a good thing to think about someday to think about those larger regional groupings in addition to the country code. And I can imagine the EU fitting into that, that same exact issue. And I have noticed that it's it's possible to do this with raw data, right? You just say, okay, these are all the countries in Africa. We're going to map those to a region called Africa. These are the countries in the EU. We're going to map them to a, a region called EU. And Open Alex does do that. Uh, but yeah, that's not itself in raw right now. Sasha, I'll make a note to send you that um, existing roadmap feature request in a bit. Yeah. And uh, the reason also why we go with more specific location um, details is that it allows for a lot better disambiguation, especially in the case of if you think of a country like China, a lot of the records in the funder registry are using kind of variably translated names um, that can have similar or overlapping forms. So when only indicated at the country level in a country as big as China, you don't know what province they're yeah. associated with. You don't know if it's a federal level ministry. You don't know, you know, if it's a city level ministry um, and those things quickly become very confusing without more granular um, location. We have had some requests to, you know, essentially represent things at the national level, which is possible based on the presence of a GI names ID, for example, for a country. Um, you know, so we're not necessarily opposed to it if it's appropriate for the organization. And they really explicitly assert that, you know, like, yes, we have a location maybe in a specific place, but really we're like a Swiss organization that serves all of Switzerland and we want our record to be reflected at the level of Switzerland. Okay, we can accommodate that and we're happy to be in like kind of dialogue about how those things are represented. Uh, but that's just kind of a further clarification about how we approach locations. Yep. Um, we do have another question in the chat about um, Ethiopian um, science. Um, and I think probably the general answer to your question, Abdisha, is that when ROAR is integrated into other systems, it should allow um, both national and institutional tracking better. So precisely that geographic information in a ROAR record, um, you can say, here are all the Ethiopian research organizations that we know about. And so when a system um, for instance, like dimensions or uh, or open Alex, something that or Crossref that is meant to track research outputs broadly uh, when they adopt ROAR, um, it should ROAR should enable those systems to allow people to ask questions um, such as, you know, can you can you give me all of the um, research outputs from my country? as well as from my institution. I actually happened to notice recently, uh, one of the things that I track that I don't tend to put on these calls very much, but is on our about page, is, um, is I track mentions of ROAR in scholarly literature. And just recently I noticed that Serbia has stood up a national research tracking system that does make use of ROAR. Um, and these are increasingly popular. Ireland has just um, had quite a big um, initiative uh, and they've launched a national open access monitor in their case. Sometimes people want to track just the research coming from their country. Um, sometimes they want to track specifically open access compliance. Um, so different things. Um, we are actually working with the Africa Pit Alliance uh, to uh, try to increase coverage of African organizations in ROAR, um, specifically but not exclusively uh, African funding organizations. Um, and I think they are also working with dimensions to make sure that those have have grid IDs within within dimensions as well. So, yep. 
further comments. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Chris is asking, are there any discussions with NIH, NLM, NCBI about incorporating ROAR? Um, yeah. And as Adam points out, they have a, quite a few repositories and services. Are you thinking specifically, Chris, uh, and feel free to unmute if you like, um, are you thinking specifically about PubMed and PubMed Central or? Um, PubMed, yep. Uh, you know, I need to follow up with PubMed and PubMed Central. Um, they are using, uh, they use Roar IDs for um, essentially open access tracking for internal purposes, right? So, uh, but they are not exposing them in PubMed metadata or PubMed Central metadata. Um, that being said, I, Aaron Zellers is often um, uh, in attendance on these calls, I don't, I don't think they are today. And um, I think there are ongoing conversations. But I, I, I have to admit, Chris, it has been um, quite a while since I've talked to um, NAH, uh, NCBI staff about including Roar in PubMed. So it may be time for another push. Um, one thing that, uh, one, one initiative that is ongoing with NIH is that we are involved in the NIH Gray Initiative, so the Generalist Repository Ecosystem Initiative, um, in, but that isn't really NIH managed systems. That is merely an initiative that NIH is spearheading to, um, among other things, um, ensure ROAR adoption in various generalist repositories that are not managed by NIH. And in fact, uh, I think it was Kelly who suggested the formation of the uh, ROAR adoption group um, in, um, that gray initiative. So thank you, Kelly, for, for seeing that. But yeah, in, in terms of PubMed, not so far, um, but I can see about following up. Ah, um, yes. Uh, I hope that many of us can uh, meet up at PIDFest and or at SSP. I will be at SSP, so if anybody uh, will be at SSP, if anybody will be at PIDFest, um, we'll hope to foregather in person. Uh, and may I just also mention as well, uh, we'll, we'll end up here, but uh, we do have uh, the next Roar Community Call is scheduled for July 2024. Uh, you can register for that now on the Roar Events page. And uh, we hope to see you there then, but we will also send reminders, especially to the Roar Community Forum. Um, so if you have not already joined that, please do. And we will issue the slides and recording um, to all of you who have registered and attended. So we thank you for coming and we hope to see you later in the year. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks all. Oops. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Shall we drop out before gathering Slack?